So today we're going to take a look at the different types of radiation and specifically we're going to look at what causes each of the different types of radiation and how we can predict particles that we haven't actually measured what kind of radiation they will undergo. I guess the first thing to have a look at is what is radiation and why does it happen in the first place? So the general idea behind this is that everything in the universe doesn't matter what you are you're trying to become more stable. So you might have heard of something called heat death, which is one of the predictions for the end of the universe, which is the idea that everything will eventually decay to photons and be at uniform temperature and energy. So that is the most stable you can be, and everything is essentially moving towards achieving that. So then radiation is one of the mechanisms through which you can do that. So the different types of decay are just mechanisms to become more stable. Okay. So in terms of stability, what can make things unstable? So there's a few different things. There are many more, by the way. Um, so if you have very high energy, so things that are really hot, for instance, are very unstable. Um, if you have high mass, so like really big objects, pretty unstable. Um, if you have a large charge, that's not particularly stable. Um, so as I mentioned, also temperature and energy are kind of interlinked there. Okay, so let's have a look at the first mechanism for that, which is alpha radiation. So, alpha radiation essentially happens to nuclei that are really big, so they have excessive mass. So, the way they do that is by emitting a helium nucleus, or an alpha particle. And your alpha particle is made up of two neutrons and two protons. So it has a nucleon number of four and a proton number of two. Okay, so... In terms of the properties of alpha radiation, alpha is known as the most ionizing type of radiation. So what ionizing it means is it's your ability to strip electrons off of different atoms. So alpha is the most powerful at doing that. It will cause the most ionizations. And because it has a really short range, so typically in air it's about three to five centimeters, all of those ionizations happen in a really concentrated area which is why alpha radiation is so toxic if you were to possibly ingest it, because it would cause a large amount of damage or a large amount of cell mutations in a very small area, which is very bad for you. Um, but it's also the reason it's not particularly dangerous when it's outside of your body, because obviously your skin is a barrier to that. Okay, so in terms of it being useful, not dangerous, uh, if you look around the room you're in right now, you should probably see a smoke detector. And that detector makes use of the short range of alpha radiation because it's set up a circuit inside there in which there's a gap which alpha particles are currently able to go across because it's a very small gap. But when smoke particles get into that gap, they block the alpha radiation actually and it stops the circuit being complete, which sets off the alarm in your smoke detector. So it's quite a useful property having this short range when we put it to use. So uh, most smoke detectors use americium. Uh, in them. Uh, there's a slight variation, but that's typically what they would use. Okay, so the second and third modes are kind of lumped together and called beta radiation overall. So let's start off looking at beta minus. So both kinds of radiation are moderately ionizing, so they're not as good as alpha, but they're much better than gamma in terms of the number of ionizations each particle can cause. But uh, the beta minus is so called because is carried by the beta minus particle, also called an electron. Okay, so that's the particle produced as a result of beta minus decay. And it has a slightly bigger range, so we had three to five centimeters before, but this is more like 15, 20, that kind of range in air. So in terms of the uses we can put beta radiation to, um, it's really good for measuring the thickness of materials. So just kind of in the way we used alpha in the smoke detector, um, you can use it to measure the thickness of things because if your material is too thick, uh, a smaller amount of beta radiation gets through to your detector, so that tells you it's too thick, and if too many particles get through, it tells you it's too thin. So you can kind of use it in that way. Um, but on the flip side, so it's slightly less ionizing than alpha, but it's more penetrating because it can get through thicker or more air or thicker materials, which makes it more dangerous because it can actually start to penetrate the skin and stuff, for instance. Beta plus is an interesting one. Um, so this is actually a type of radiation that produces an antiparticle because it produces a positron or a beta plus particle. So 
Theoretically, it should have the same range as beta minus, but it never gets that far because it always annihilates straight away with electrons in the air. So hopefully you'll have come across the process of annihilation in the particle physics part of the course. Uh, if you haven't, do look that up. It's pretty interesting stuff. Um, so that's what's going on with beta plus. Um, we can, even though we're using antiparticles here, we can still make use of this. So a lot of medical imaging, or specifically PET scanners, um, produce positrons, and when they annihilate with electrons, produce very high energy rays, like X rays, gamma rays, which we can detect outside the body. So we actually use these extensively in scanners. Um, so we can put that to use. Okay, so that's beta. So let's look at the final type, gamma radiation. So um, as you'll have learned about in the particle physics part, electromagnetic waves only have one-to-one -one interaction. So one photon can only interact with one electron. So each gamma photon can only cause one ionization. So it's the least ionizing. However, it has a considerably bigger range in the order of magnitude of hundreds of meters. So um, it's by far the most dangerous if it's not inside you because it can travel long distances and can penetrate through very, very thick materials. You need some serious lead or concrete walls to be able to stop it. So we can make use of its high energy and high penetration because we use it quite a lot for sterilizing. So anything that's in a sealed container that has been sterilized has probably been bombarded with some kind of gamma radiation as a means of, of destroying any kind of bacteria or viruses and stuff that have got into it. So we can put it to good use. And one thing you'll learn about as part of the course, you may have looked at already, is the inverse square law of gamma radiation. Um, so the intensity or the power per unit area will decrease the further away you get. And if you double the distance, you will quarter the intensity. So it follows this kind of law here, um, but that allows it to cover long ranges as well. Okay, so that's your gamma radiation. So that's a lot of information I've just hit you with, but there's a really nice diagram that summarizes all of this, uh, which I will get on to in a second, but let's quickly take a look at the general equations of each of these types of decay, because it's important that you're able to use these in part of your decay chains. Okay, so alpha radiation, we know emits a helium nucleus or an alpha particle. Uh, we know an alpha particle has two neutrons and two protons, so it contains four nucleons and two protons. Therefore, whatever is produced will essentially be the original minus two neutrons and two protons. So the nucleon number will go down by four, the proton number will go down by two. Okay? Then beta minus, we know that an electron is produced. So what has happened is a neutron has been converted into a proton and an electron through the weak interaction. So what we can see here is that because a neutron turns into a proton, nucleon number doesn't change, so we have the same nucleon number. But the proton number has increased, because we've now got one more, so we've now got z plus one. And we've got our electron here, and then to conserve electron-lepton number, we have to have an anti-electron neutrino on the end. Um, you'll look at more of those kind of laws that balance these equations as part of the particle physics course. Beta plus, you produce a positron, so what you've done is you convert a proton into a neutron. So again, nuclear number stays the same, proton number decreases by one, because you've got rid of one proton essentially, and then we need a electron neutrino here to balance the electron lepton number of your positron, which is minus one. And then lastly, gamma radiation doesn't actually cause a change in the particles of the nucleus, it causes a change in the energy of the nucleus. So usually this happens as a result of other kinds of decay. So after, after an alpha radiation, for instance, the nucleus might be left with very high energy, and its means to get rid of that energy is by sending out photons of gamma radiation there. So that's kind of what's going on with gamma. Okay, so if we look down this list, we can see that actually alpha and the two betas will cause a change in the element that we're dealing with. So that's why I've changed it from Y to a W, because if you change the proton number, you change the element. So you're looking at something different there. Whereas gamma, we can see we don't actually change the element, we just change the energy. So let's have a look at that graph I was referring to earlier. Um, it's called an NZ graph, because what you're doing is you're plotting nucleon number on your y-axis against proton number on your x-axis. And there's a few lines drawn on here. So these red blobs here 
are particles that actually exist. This is where the things in the periodic table lie on the NZ graph. We've got this green line, which is your N equals Z line. So essentially, um, that's just to give you reference to where this line is going here. And the reason it goes above it is because for, when you have a larger number of protons, you need a much larger number of neutrons to balance, so the strong force balances the electromagnetic force. Because obviously the electromagnetic force is infinite range, whereas the strong force from the neutrons is only short range. So you actually need many more protons to balance the two forces when you have large numbers of protons. So that's why it kind of bends upwards there. And then we have these different zones labelled. So below the this line here, this is called the stability line where all the blobs are, because obviously the elements are the stable part, we can see there's a region called the beta plus emitters. So in this region here below, they've got too many protons, which is making it high, very high charge and so unstable. So what happens is they get rid of a proton by getting rid of a positron and turning it into a neutron. Above the line, you have too many neutrons. So that essentially is going to rectify itself by turning neutrons into protons because a proton is the most stable type of baryon as you'll learn in the particle physics part of the course. So what happens is neutrons turn into protons and then it moves us back towards this stability line here. Now there's this region or this dotted line here at uh, proton number equals 80 and anything to the right of that is known as in the, what's called the alpha zone. So anything that's to the right of this line will decay through alpha radiation, which is a bit of a contradiction of what I said earlier, because what I said was that alpha is caused by excessive like, size or excessive mass in your nucleus. Um, that's actually not quite correct, but it is kind of correct. So you can actually see from here it's caused by excessive protons. If everything to the right of this line decays, that would indicate it's the protons that are doing it, not the mass. However, in addition to always trying to become more stable, things always try and take the most efficient path possible to become more stable. So in this region here, to the left of the alpha line, but below the stability line, the most efficient mechanism is through beta plus. So that's to do with having excess protons. To the right of this line, however, it becomes more efficient as a way of getting rid of your instability to so you go through alpha scattering. And because that happens to essentially larger nuclei, that's why we call it having excessive mass causes alpha, because alpha only applies to the larger nuclei. So that's what's going on there, but it's still actually the charge that's causing the instability in your nucleus, and is actually excessive protons there. Um, but this graph is a really useful way of visualising the different types of radiation and it also because we can go, okay, so what about this isotope of this element? Or we can just go, um, I don't know, it's here. Oh, we know what kind of radiation it's going to undergo because we can find it on our graph, which is quite useful because you just don't need to experimentally test everything. But like I said earlier, this stability line is where all the elements of your periodic table occur. It's the isotopes that shift them kind of either side of this line, and that's why the isotopes are the ones that are more radioactive than the stable elements we are familiar with there. Okay, so um, I hope that found, you found that useful and to improve your understanding of the different types of radiation. If you've spotted any mistakes or anything that's not clear, please do let me know in the comments section below. And as usual, thank you very much for watching.